Good morning, everybody. Um, Tansi uh, Ilatani. Uh, my name is Stephen Nichols. I'm with Crown Indigenous Relations. Uh, I figured I'd just start talking as we get the, the tech up and running. Um, I'm with Crown Indigenous Relations in Northern Affairs Canada. Um, I'm currently a policy advisor with the uh, Engagement and Policy Directorate uh, based out of Ottawa. Uh, but like Cam said, uh, I am from Alberta. Uh, I, I live in Treaty 6 territory. Um, I My substantive position is the head of Indian registration and ban list for Alberta. So I've been in registration since 2013, uh, but I've been working for headquarters for about the last year and a half on uh, consultation on Bill S3 uh, and what we're calling the collaborative process on Indian registration, ban membership, and First Nation citizenship. Um, can you make it bigger? Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is, um, as Cam mentioned, some of the changes to registration uh, as a result of Bill S3. I'm also going to talk about the collaborative process consultation uh, that I've been involved with for the last year and a half um, to talk about uh, kind of the three streams of consultation. Um, but I, I'm going to try and focus, if I can, more on what we heard from communities and kind of the next steps on how we can move forward with the reform. Um, I have been in this program uh, for about seven years now. Uh, I, I've had a chance to travel all across the country uh, and visit communities to talk about these issues. Um, I have uh, had the chance to hear about all the challenges, the issues, the problems, the systemic challenges. Um, it, it, it's been uh, unbelievable uh, what I, I have heard. Um, the things that people are, are forced to deal with uh, in First Nations communities. Uh, my heart really does go out to everyone who, who has been impacted by this. Uh, and I do say at the beginning of all of these presentations that I am not here to defend uh, Canada, the history of this. I, I am not here to defend the Indian Act. Uh, I'm a bit of a technical expert from the government side uh, as far as the provisions for registration. Uh, so I can talk about it. I'm going to use technical terms for from the Indian Act, um, but in no way, shape, or form am I here to defend the, the history of this. Um, it, it, it's it, it's very much a challenging issue, um, but Canada at, at the moment is very focused on reform and change, uh, and that's why I've been involved in, in this process. Um, through registration uh, in Edmonton, um, I have had a chance to work with children's services, uh, with kids in care, so uh, I have heard the stories, uh, I, I've met the children, uh, I know the impacts are real, um, the story is real, I, I have heard stories about all sorts of different uh, aspects around status, registration, treaties, and, and the impact on communities, uh, and I, I just want to echo the sense sentiments of the chief. Um, my, my heart really does go out to folks who uh, have been forced to deal with this. Um, my focus here is really going to be on reform, uh, and that's what Crown Indigenous Relations is really focused on. Uh, and so as we kind of get through the presentation, you'll start to see where um, Canada is trying to implement uh, changes based on what was heard through the consultation process. Um, Bill S3 and the collaborative process was really about um, trying to uh, address issues around rights. I mean, that's why I was invited here today. Uh, so thank you, Cam, for inviting me. Uh, it's not easy to get up here and, and, and speak after, you know, what we just heard from the chiefs, but uh, it, it, it is my job to do that, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it is, on, honestly, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Um, the changes to registration are an effort to address sex-based discrimination uh, that has been existent within the Indian Act and within some of the practices of the federal government since the late 1800s. So these are issues that go back uh, almost 150 years, uh, maybe if not more. Uh, and Canada has been attempting to fix these since the infamous Bill C-31 of the 1980s. Um, but uh, this is kind of the third attempt now through legislation. 
Um, this slide right here is is kind of a bit of a, an overview. Um, normally when I do these sessions, I'm in communities, uh, and so I, I prefer to have a bit of a conversation to, with folks, so um, I'm not typically accustomed to sticking to my slides, but because we're being filmed and I'm going to be on the internet for all eternity now, um, I should probably maybe try and stick to the slides a little bit. Uh, so I don't get into too much trouble as I do this. Um, so normally it's a bit of a conversation and people are asking questions as I go. Uh, but like Cam said, we'll do the questions afterwards. Um, I can answer questions on anything uh, that we talk about at this presentation. So feel free to throw those questions at me. Uh, and I'll be available afterwards too. Um, I, I know Cam kind of joked about you know the Yeti, but I, I will be around afterwards. Um, so if you have personal questions that you don't feel comfortable with asking, in the crowd, I, I am available afterwards. We could, we could have a one-on-one -on -one if, if you like. Um, the history of sex-based inequities or women losing status due to marriage um, is really what Bill S3 was all about. Um, it, like I said, it was the third attempt. Um, the first attempt was in 1985 with Bill C-31. Um, as I understand it, uh, before 1985, status uh, was based on having two status parents. It, it was aligned with the concept of blood quantum or, or having kind of full blood. Uh, so uh, you would have uh, kind of two First Nations people would have a child. The child would be eligible for status. A First Nations man was able to pass status through marriage. So if he married a non-First Nations woman, she would gain status and you would have two status parents. Uh, but if a First Nations woman married a non-First Nations man, she would lose her status and have to leave. So you all, it, there was always kind of a scenario where there were two status parents. Um, or there was none. There, there were women losing status. Uh, this practice goes all the way back to the 1800s. Uh, as I, I understand it, in 1850, um, before legislation was first put into place, um, kind of the definition of you know First Nations person or Indian, as is called in, in uh, the Indian Act, uh, was a, a member of a band or a descendant of a member of a band. It was gender neutral, it was um, kind of all encompassing, um, but that changed in 1869 with the introduction of the Gradual Enfranchisement Act. Uh, this idea around uh, First Nations people becoming full Canadians and enfranchising uh, and gaining the ability to vote, gaining certain rights with Canada. Um, but the downside to that was they were also being disenfranchised from their First Nation, right? And that's something that we don't really talk about very much, but. Uh, uh, as people were being enfranchised as Canadians, they were also being removed from their band list and being disenfranchised or disconnected from their First Nations. Uh, Canada took a kind of a patrilineal approach where um, descendants of male First Nations individuals were able to gain status. Um, if children were born that were male, they were able to gain status, um, where parents were not married. Uh, but if the children were uh, female, they weren't able to. It was very much male-dominated. Um, 1851 was the creation of the registration process. Before uh, 1951, um, it was primarily band lists. Uh, which, uh, from Canada's perspective, was really treaty pay lists were kind of the first banned lists. Um, on those pay lists, uh, if you've ever seen any of those, um, I was waiting for the planes to fly overhead. Uh, on, on the pay list, what you would have initially was at the top, you would have the first chief. The very first pay list had the very first chief. He was, he was number one. Um, the headmen or counselors were number two, three, four, and so on. Uh, and that's where kind of the family numbers on the ban list first came from. Uh, but spouses and children were just numbers on those lists. Um, so the, the first chief, his, his name would be there. But wife would be one, and then it might say two boys, three girls. And then it wasn't until those children reached age of majority at the time, which was, I, I believe, 21 years of age, um, they would show up on the ban list with, with a new number. So they might become, you know, number 45, uh, and then they would get their family number. Uh, and then their, their spouse and their kids would then subsequently become numbers. Um, so as I go through this PowerPoint, um, 
there's questions about numbers, right? The impact of how many people are going to be affected by the changes, how many people are eligible for registration now. Uh, honestly, we're not sure. Uh, and it's because the the records that we're going back to don't necessarily have names and dates of birth. Um, there's a lot of numbers on old pay lists. So um, there, there are some estimates here, and I will definitely talk about the numbers, but um, it, it's a bit of a guessing game right now. Um, 1951 is important because that's when all of the uh, pay lists were initially amalgamated into the creation of the Indian Register. Um, as I understand it, uh, Prior to 1951, the pay lists were managed on reserve by Indian agents. And those Indian agents had no real oversight. Um, it was, you know, the early 1900s. So uh, I've heard stories, and I'm sure there's stories here in the room, of Indian agents adding people randomly, crossing people off that they didn't like. Um, they had all sorts of power over who was and was not a band member. And uh, so Canada attempted to put some controls on that by amalgamating and creating the Indian Register uh, and creating the role of the registrar, who was then responsible for maintaining the register. So 1951 is an important date. Uh, it, it comes up uh, in future legislation, and it was one of the, the focuses of the consultation that we were talking about. Um, but registration itself started uh, in 1951. Bill C-31 was the first attempt to try and address some of the sex-based discrimination. Uh, in, I think it was 1982, Canada repatriated uh, the Constitution, and then I think it was 1984, implemented the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and defined um, human rights for Canadians. And so, uh, in 84, Canada was instructed to review all of its legislation, uh, and identify anything that might be discriminatory or a violation of the new Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And as we can all guess, the Indian Act was identified as one of the discriminatory acts. Uh, so, uh, Bill C-31 was developed in an attempt to address some of the discrimination. And so, uh, as it says up here on the slide, uh, women who had lost status due to marriage uh, were reinstated. They were able to regain their status as well as their children. Uh, anybody who had acquired status before 1985 was able to keep their status, uh, which is a bit of a contentious uh, issue when I go into communities. Um, one of the examples, uh, it's not the only one, but one of the examples is women who had gained status through marriage were able to keep their status. Um, and so I, I, I did get a lot of questions around, you know, why did they get to keep it? Uh, it was Canada's intent to maintain acquired rights. Um, enfranchisement uh, as a process was abolished in 1985. Um, uh, it, there were a lot of ways prior to 1985 for people to lose status. Um, if you wanted to go to university, you had to give up your status. If you wanted to be a doctor, if you wanted to be a lawyer, if you wanted to vote, um, if you lived, I think it's in the U.S. for five years, maybe seven, five or seven years, you would lose your status. Um, and so the, the concept of enfranchisement was officially abolished. And as a result, now there's no way of having a name removed from the Indian Register unless it was put there in error. From, from Canada's perspective, um, if somebody voluntarily applies to register uh, and is eligible for registration, their name will be added to the register and it never comes off. The only, the only changes that can be made are, are uh, deemed administrative errors. So if somebody applies um, and uh, they're not really eligible, um, you know, maybe somebody says they're the father, but they're not actually the father, uh, could be found through DNA tests or, or other means, um, they can be removed um, uh, through kind of Canada's responsibility for maintaining the integrity of the register. Um, but as it stands right now, there is there's no other way of coming off the register which has become a bit of an issue that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, there was also now the creation of uh, what we know as Category 6.1 and 6.2. Uh, the Indian Act was rewritten. Uh, paragraph 6 of the Indian Act are the provisions for registration. So um, 
to oversimplify kind of the categories and, and the way registration works, 6-1 is basically an individual with two status parents. There are more subcategories. There's an A, B. There, there used to be a C. There's a D, E, and an F as well. Um, but they're all examples of people who uh, have two status parents. Um, but with the reinstatement of the women who had lost status due to marriage, um, and um, the abolishment of the marriage provision that allowed for the passing of status through marriage, you now had instances where there was only one status parent. Uh, the women who had lost status due to marriage obviously married somebody who was non-status, and their children only technically had one status parent. There was no ability for the woman to pass status to the man uh, through, a, say, a marriage provision. That was eliminated. So category 6-2 was created. Uh, it was a special provision for basically the children of C31 women. Uh, and that's where some of the problems had, have come in. Um, what you tend to see in, in these scenarios is, um, you know, you've got a 6-1 woman marries a non-status man, uh, she loses her status. That's kind of the, I'll say, the grandparent generation. Uh, underneath of that, you now have kids who have been disconnected from their community potentially for decades. Um, these marriages all happened before 85. Uh, so you've got people who are living off reserve, uh, no connection necessarily to their community, um, and most likely parent with somebody who is also non, non-status or non-First Nations. Uh, and so we start to fall into what we call the second generation cutoff. So you have a 6-1 grandmother, you have a 6-2 parent, um, and then once the grandchildren are born, there's no status. The ability to transmit uh, disappears. Because paragraph 6-2 says um, you can have one status parent, but that one parent has to be a 6-1. And what that means in effect is a single 6-2 parent can't pass status. Uh, and one of the examples where I see that um, a lot is uh, kids in care. You see children ending up uh, in social services, uh, and on their birth certificate, they might have one parent's name, the mother's name, but the dad's name is silent. And so if mom is a 6-2, dad's name is not there, that child is not able to register. Uh, and so some of the changes under Bill S-3 are around that specific issue. Uh, the chief uh, from Frog Lake kind of alluded to it as well about uh, fathers and, and, and the role there. Um, it does impact ability to transmit status from something as simple as a father's name not being on a birth certificate. It can impact whether it's 6-1 or 6-2. Uh, and if the mom is a 6-2, then there's no ability to pass status. And so uh, what you start to see there is once it hits the grandkid generation, there's, there's no more status as a result of this. Uh, and that's where Sharon MacGyver comes in um, with Bill C-3. Uh, she took Canada to court. Uh, and uh, as Cam kind of alluded to, uh, a lot of times when Canada ends up in court, Canada loses. Uh, we are on the wrong side of this. Uh, so uh, Bill C-3, to oversimplify, uh, was uh, changes to the registration provisions to allow some of these 6-2 parents to get a category amendment to, to become 6-1 so that they could then pass status on to the grandkids. So what you started to see after 2011 was um, category amendments for parents and grandchildren now being eligible to register. Uh, Bill S-3, the DeShano court case, uh, is, is also in line with a lot of this. It's very similar in that uh, now we're basically talking about the great grandkid generation. Um, exact same scenario, right? So under C-3, uh, parents were able to become 6-1 so that the grandkids be could become 6-2. But if those grandkids parent with a non-status person, the great-grandkids are no longer eligible for status. And so what the Quebec court, the Quebec Superior Court in 2015 under the Descheno court case, uh, what they found was that the sex-based discrimination hasn't been eliminated. It has just been kind of pushed down the road, uh, and it is uh, just kind of moving generation to generation. So uh, C3 moved it to the grandkid generation. Um, S3 is now trying to clean up the great grandkid generation. But it's still there. Right, um, that 6-2 provision um, still exists. 
some of what I'm talking about is, uh, to, I'm going to talk about 1951, I'm going to talk about the 1800s, um, and, but there weren't really any changes for 1985 forward. And that's where 6.1 and 6.2 really come into play. Uh, and this ability to transmit status um, through the current provisions for registration, um, there are demographic studies that show that even though uh, descendants of First Nations people are the fastest growing population in Canada, the ability to transmit status because of this system is going to disappear. And over about four generations, depending on which province or territory you're in, it goes from about 87% eligibility uh, down to about 10% ability to transmit status in just four generations or about 100 years. So without any changes to the current system for registration, status will disappear over time. Um, in the 1980s, with Bill C-31, um, there were estimates of uh, impacts, people eligible for registration. Um, some of the numbers are written at the bottom. The initial estimates were, I believe, around 100,000. Uh, my slide here says 174,000. Uh, I've heard it's closer to 300,000. Uh, so Canada was off by a factor of three. Uh, as Cam mentioned, there was a small amount of funding available for housing. Um, but what I have heard uh, in every community that I've been to, in every presentation I do this, uh, the funding was wholly inadequate. Um, and uh, as the chief said, the Bill S3 did not come with any more monies. Uh, and so a lot of what I heard was um, there's an outstanding kind of promise or commitment for funding that goes back to the 1980s. Uh, and that did come up throughout the entire consultation process. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, you know, where, where some of this funding is already. Um, we were off by a factor of three with our estimates on who was going to be impacted initially in the 1980s. Uh, so our funding, I'm sure, is off by by a significant amount. Uh, I was in communities in Ontario where we were joking around about the money, and they were saying, you know, Stephen, you're going to fix this. And, and I said, yes. And I said, the, the price tag is is very large on this. And I said, so how much do you need? And they said, well, I'll start with $5 billion. And I said, OK, you've got it. By the end of the session, we were up to about $25 billion just for that one community. And they said, Stephen's going to pay it. So the next time I go back to Georgina Island, um, I need to bring one of those big checks and do a bit of a ceremony. Uh, I wish I was here to announce more funding. Uh, I'm going to talk about funding and, and the, the need for funding and the plan for funding, but I don't have anything official to announce at this point. I, I, I really wish I did. Um, but I, I will talk about what we're planning to do. Because um, funding is a factor. It, it is definitely something that we heard. Uh, and honestly, this is a, a slide where I, I used to skip a lot of this into communities. Um, Elders did not appreciate me coming into the community and, and explaining the history of the Indian Act to people who had lived it for decades. Um, anybody who's gone through this, you know, for 50, 60 or more years um, knows it much better than I do. Uh, so I used to try to skip over this part. I went through it now because I'm partially because I'm on camera, um, but partially because there is there is a history and some context to the next slides. And, and I am trying to kind of stick to the PowerPoint. Uh, the Deshano court case led to a two-phased approach for Canada. Um, there were some issues identified in the court case, um, but what the court said was um, there are other issues related to registration uh, and band membership. Um, Canada has been hearing them for a long time. There was an exploratory process in 2010, 2011, as a result of Bill C-3 and the, the Sharon MacGyver case. Um, the themes were Indian registration band membership and First Nation citizenship. Uh, and as I mentioned at the front, I was on a consultation around Indian registration, band membership, and First Nation citizenship. Some of the themes um, have been around for a long time. Uh, it's not the first time that Canada has been hearing about the issues. And the Quebec Superior Court uh, said uh, to Canada to, number one, um, fix the issues that were identified by the Deshano and the Yantha family in the Deshano court case. Uh, but number two, feel free to go beyond that. There are other issues, and so look at fixing all of those other issues if you can. 
Uh, and so Canada's approach was, number one, some minor uh, legislative amendments to address the issues in the court case, but number two, to launch a consultation around the changes, the impacts, the other remaining inequities, and to try and start on the path for broader reforms to try and fix this system, um, hopefully for the good, uh, so that there won't have to be more court cases as we get to kind of maybe the great-great-grandkid generation. Um, so the initial response, um, there were some changes made to the Indian Act uh, in December of 2017. There were some amendments to paragraph 61C. 61C was the uh, paragraph that allowed women who had lost status due to marriage to come back. Um, so they were given a category 61C. Um, there were about six new subcategories added. Um, the issues were primarily what we call the cousins or siblings issue which was, in essence, families with different categories of registration. Um, there is a slide further in the deck as well uh, that shows um, how, just based on dates of birth and individuals' gender, uh, how kids and grandkids could end up with different categories. And so what the, the argument was in Quebec was that, um, you know, people from the same family should all have the same status, basically. So uh, the court saw that some kids or cousins, some might be 6'1", some might be 6'2", some might be 6'2", some would be non-status, but they saw that it was different. So there were some changes made for people born between 1985 and 1951 uh, who were now able to uh, get a, a category amendment so that they would all be 6'1". Um, there were also some issues around minors, uh, children who were omitted from uh, the registers or the pay lists. Um, they were able to come back. Um, there was also a decision from a court in Ontario. It was, uh, I think, a 23-year-old court case, a uh, lady last name Gale. Um, she had uh, a, a complicated background, um, and she did not put her biological father's name on the birth certificate. Um, she had no connection to her father. The, the story behind that is, is kind of gruesome, uh, so I, I won't go into the story too much. Um, but she was not able to register because her dad's name wasn't on the birth certificate, and she thought that that was wrong. Um, it took her 23 years to fight that, uh, but the courts agreed with her. She was right. Um, there are legitimate reasons why someone would not put a dad's name on a birth certificate. She had some legitimate reasons, uh, and... Uh, but it took her 23 years to, to fight this, right? So uh, included in Bill S-3 were some provisions around unknown or unstated parentage to try and reduce the burden on applicants um, in these issues where dad's name is not mentioned. Um, the last one was kind of the first focus of the consultation. Um, uh, Sharon MacGyver, as well as uh, a couple other women, have been fighting Canada for decades, um, saying that the, even though registration only goes till 1951, the, the history of women losing status due to marriage goes all the way back to the 1800s. Uh, because registration was first started in 1951, um, in the court cases where Canada was being sued, um, the changes to registration only had to go back to 1951 because that's when registration first started. Uh, and so Sharon MacGyver and a, and a few others have said that, you know, um, Canada needs to go all the way back to the 1800s with this, not stop at 1951. You know, there are people born in the 40s and 30s and 20s that are impacted by this. Uh, and they, they felt that that 1951 date was very arbitrary. Uh, the date we use is September 4th, 1951. Uh, so I've heard stories of individuals born on September 3rd and September 2nd and not being eligible for these provisions. Uh, and so the first stream of our consultation was really around removing that 1951 date. Um, so the initial impacts to Bill S3 um, as this bill was being debated, it's, it's an S bill, so it was first introduced at the Senate level, uh, where it was being debated. Uh, it was initially presented as a bill to eliminate all sex-based inequities uh, in the Indian Act. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, as it was being debated, there were questions around, well, is this really going to eliminate all the sex-based discrimination? Uh, and the answer was no, it's not. Uh, so uh, the Senate was very interested in making sure that all of the sex-based discrimination was abolished, um, going all the way back to the 1800s. Um, so there was some question around, well, how many people will be, what is that impact? Um, so there were some initial estimates, um, shows here in 2016, 750,000, 1.3 million people. And to put that in some context, there is now just over 1 million people registered. Uh, and have their names on the Indian Register. So if there's potentially 1.3 million people now eligible to register, that's more than all of the people currently registered. It, the populate, First Nations population in Canada would more than double. To give you some kind of context around the potential scope of the discrimination. Um, but these are just estimates. We're not entirely sure. The current projections now, based on uh, the changes that were made uh, most recently in August, uh, put it somewhere between 330,000 and just over half a million people. Uh, and potentially, um, these applications are projected to happen over the next 10 years. The current number that I've heard is somewhere around 7,000. Uh, we are not seeing large numbers of individuals applying to register at the moment. Uh, and I can get into that a little bit maybe during question period. Um, the broader consultation, uh, this is really kind of an overview of, of what we did. Uh, TCV were uh, involved in this process. Uh, at the time, I was doing sessions in Manitoba and Ontario, so I didn't get a chance to attend any of the TCV sessions. Um, but I, I was really glad to see that there was some representation from Alberta. Um, I, I was not surprised to see the TCV uh, bands involved in this. Uh, Alberta is very much a leader when it comes to uh, membership. Uh, it's in some of the further slides as well. Uh, across Canada, most nations, uh, I'll just go back to this one for a minute. Uh, all right, it, there's a comment here on membership. There's, there's two types of membership according to the Indian Act. There's Section 10 and Section 11 of the Indian Act. Uh, Section 11 banned, Canada still controls the banned list. So in order to be added to the banned list, you have to register with Canada. So once you register, you send in an application with a birth certificate uh, outlining parentage. Uh, if you're eligible to register, your name is automatically added to the band list. A Section 10 band, um, like some here in the room, there's a custom membership code that uh, has been adopted. Uh, Canada recognizes the control of the band list. The band list was officially transferred into the care and custody of the nation in the 1980s when the, the code was adopted. Uh, and what you're starting to see is is people who register with Canada but then go to the nation to apply for band membership. Uh, and as Cam said, there are differences between who is registered and who is a band member. Um, it seems to be uh, a reaction to Bill C-31, um, the underfunding, the lack of resources that went along with it. Uh, membership codes uh, seem to have been written in a way to keep people out. So there are people who are currently registered with Canada and on kind of the ISC or the INAC list, as it's called, uh, who are not band members. Uh, and so the, you're starting to see a, a division or a difference between who is eligible for status versus who is eligible for membership. Uh, across Canada, that uh, is not common. Most Alberta nations are Section 10, meaning they have a custom membership code. But across Canada, it is two-thirds, about two-thirds of nations, or 67%, do not have custom membership. Uh, Canada still controls their band list, so in order to become a member, you have to register. Uh, and so nations in Ontario, for example, um, have a lot to say about that whole process, which I, I will circle back to as we get into a bit of what, what I heard through the collaborative process. Um, the process itself, uh, it, it initially started with a co-design phase. 
Um, the, the consultation and the next steps were triggered by court cases. Canada had an obligation to make some changes. Uh, so it was written into Bill S3 that we would consult and that we would report back to Parliament. There were three dates. Um, two of those reports have happened. Um, there is one last date that's due in December of 2020 is one last report back. Um, the the, the co-design phase was, um, there was a call out for proposals in October of 2017 to ask nations how we should consult. What should the consultation look like? What sort of things should we be talking about? How should we do this? Uh, what we heard were a lot of principles around uh, inclusivity, flexibility, um, some funding as well. Uh, so Canada did provide monies for communities to host sessions. Uh, individuals like myself were available to come out and talk about the specifics of registration, uh, the technicalities of Bill S3 and the changes, uh, or not at all, right? Some communities... Um, applied for funding so that they could host sessions like what kind of like what we're doing now um, some asked for us to attend some said no we don't need you uh, so I did have a chance to go to communities all across the country and, and talk about this and hear from uh, community members um, Part of our overall process then was we set up a, an advisory panel um, that included uh, individuals from the, some of the national organizations. So we had a representative from the AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, um, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, or CAP, and the Native Women's Association of Canada. Um, because a lot of what we're talking about was sex-based discrimination and women losing their status. Uh, so they were a bit of an advisory panel um, on our overall process and, and how we were guiding ourselves. Minister Bennett, the Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations, uh, she did appoint a special representative, a minister special representative, or MSR. Claudette Dumont-Smith was appointed. She is uh, Algonquin from Kitigan Zibi in Quebec. Um, she hosted sessions all across the country. Uh, I was involved in sessions very similar to what I'm doing right now, talking about the changes and the issues. Uh, we did that in late September, uh, late 2018, uh, before we launched the consultation. Um, we were told very clearly that these issues are complicated, They're, they can be confusing, um, not everybody is updated uh, from uh, INAC or ISC on, on what these changes are, so uh, in order to be properly informed on what's going on, first we went out and just kind of talked about the changes and so we hosted these sorts of sessions all across the country um, funding I think it was about three million dollars or so was provided in funding for communities to host sessions um, friendship centers tribal councils uh, individual communities multiple sessions from each proposal so there were hundreds of sessions um, some were focused on elders some were focused on youth some were broader community members um, some were done on reserve off reserve to get different perspectives on things. Uh, and the MSR hosted 15 sessions across the country. Um, we did two in Alberta. We did, um, we did one for Treaty 6 and 7, and then one for Treaty 8 uh, in the, f the winter of last year. Uh, we did about 15 across the country. One representative from each First Nation was invited to attend, uh, funded by our department. Uh, we are now going out uh, again. Uh, we just started. We're doing another 27 of these similar sessions now to come back out and say, this is what we heard, right? Um, and this is kind of what Canada has planned for the next steps. Uh, and um, look to maybe how we can work together on some of these changes based on what was heard through the process. So Alberta sessions are planned right now March 2nd in Treaty 7, March 4th, Wednesday, March 4th in Edmonton for Treaty 6, and Friday, March 6th uh, in Grand Prairie for Treaty 8. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in Manitoba for a couple of sessions there. Uh, the Alberta sessions are scheduled for March. So if you do see emails coming out, um, that's what it, what it's about. Uh, I believe we sent save the dates at the moment, uh, but the official uh, invite hasn't been sent, I don't believe, for Alberta. Um, but that is the plan right now. Um, for So for Treaty 6, March 4th in Edmonton is, is the plan. Uh, and again, we're going to pay, uh, my department is going to pay for the travel um, for, for one representative from each First Nation to attend. Um, 
part of our consultation uh, was also online. There was a survey. Um, we had something like 14,000, I believe it was 14,000 individuals uh, went online, filled out the survey. Some folks were not comfortable talking about these issues and the impacts in sessions, so there was a kind of a separate venue so that people could provide private uh, confidential input. Uh, if they weren't able to make sessions, they could go online and fill out the survey. Um, we also intended to talk to other governments and provinces. At one point, I was going to go and talk to all the different provincial governments around impacts. Um, we did talk to the Métis. Um, I, I had the privilege of being kind of the lead on the Métis uh, conversation around impacts. Um, but we haven't really gone out to the provincial governments quite yet. Um, everything that we heard kind of wrapped up around April, um, but we were flexible in our approach. Some communities wanted more time, um, so I kept doing sessions into June and even July. Um, but uh, a report to Parliament was tabled on June 12th, uh, based on what we heard through the consultation. The three themes to the consultation, this is really where I was trying to get to. Um, this is what we talked about in, in throughout the process. The three themes were, number one, um, the intent to remove the 1951 cutoff. Um, it was a delayed provision in Bill S3. So it was written into law that Canada would remove the 1951 cutoff and would allow people impacted by sex-based discrimination or women losing status going all the way back to the 1800s. But with these large numbers of, you know, potentially as high as 1.3 million, um, we wanted to consult on that impact first. Right, so what would be the impact and how can Canada help mitigate some of the negative impacts um, that might exist from people regaining their status and wanting to come back to communities? Number two was that, you know, go further, go beyond, right? What other issues are there related to registration um, that are impacting uh, individuals and future descendants? Um, some of the issues that we heard were uh, adoptions, unknown on state of paternity, um, issues of uh, ancestors who had enfranchised. The, the second generation cutoff is a big one that came up uh, a lot. Um, the Métis um, uh, were very concerned with deregistration or the ability for Métis individuals to come off the register who had an eligibility and applied, um, but didn't want to lose their Métis citizenship. Uh, and then stream number three was really around um, Canada getting out of the registration business and putting First Nations membership or citizenship back to where it was always meant to be um, with the exclusive jurisdiction of registration or membership and citizenship being with the nations. So stream number three was can Canada get out of this business and just leave it up to the nations to determine who their members are. Uh, and I can tell you that that is what I heard uh, loud and clear. I, I've heard it uh, for as long as I've been in the program. Uh, you know who your people are. It is your communities, your members, your people. Um, Canada should not be telling you who, who is eligible for members. Uh, what I heard loud and clear is that nations should be telling Canada who is eligible, not Canada telling nations. Um, I did go back and do some research on this. Uh, I heard it in the very first session. Um, in 1951, in, in the Indian Act, uh, it did say that a member of a band was eligible to register. Now, there were also some other discriminatory things written about um, uh, kids, omitted children, born out of wedlock. There, there were some other provisions that weren't so nice uh, in the Indian Act. But in 1951, a member of a band was eligible to register. Um, in 1985, um, Section 10 was created uh, with the intent of giving membership to the nations, but in effect, it's, it's very strongly linked to registration. So what happens now, um, typically you see somebody register first and then apply for band membership. But historically, Canada didn't dictate who band members were. That was up to the, the nations to determine their own members. Uh, and then people who were eligible for federal programs and services were those band members. So uh, historically, you were a band member first, and then you would register with Canada. But now it's flipped. 
the, the way the legislation is written. You register first and then become a band member. So a lot of what I heard in communities in Ontario was Canada's created a mess. Um, in, in Ontario, they say, uh, you know, Canada is creating Ottawa Indians, not Anishinaabe or Haudenosaunee. Um, you've created a mess. We don't want to touch your mess. Um, clean it up first, um, but start respecting our laws, right? We have always had a way of managing our membership and our citizens. Some don't use the term citizen at all. Uh, and for my purposes, I use them interchangeably, but I do acknowledge that citizenship and membership is, is a different concept. Um, but that fundamental principle of membership and citizenship belongs to the nations. Canada should not be doing that. And if Canada truly wants to implement the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, um, Article 9 talks about self-determination. So as long as Canada is in the identity business and um, dictating who is and is not a First Nations person, um, from my perspective, and I'm not a lawyer, it seems that we cannot implement UNDRIP un until Canada gets out of the business. Uh, and Minister Bennett was very intent on doing that. At one of the sessions in the Senate, she actually pointed to the registrar, the Indian registrar, and said, I want to put her out of work. Uh, and the registrar of the day was very fine with that. Um, she herself was First Nations, uh, and, and she would kind of joke about, you know, going to work in the mail room and just opening mail. She'd be very happy just doing that as long as she kept her salary. Um, but the idea, there is a quote, I, I don't have it right now, but the quote was that we would get out of the registration business. But how, how would we do that? What would that look like? Um, on the removal of the 1951 cutoff, there was overwhelming support for women and their descendants who had lost as due to marriage to get it back. Um, there was no question about that. Um, some of my favorite responses that I heard were, you know, we would ask the question of like, when should we remove the 1951 cutoff? Um, m one of my favorites was yesterday, right? Um, do it immediately. Uh, never should have happened in the first place were, were some of the responses. It was very clear. Um, I even started asking the question of, you know, should we not remove the 1951 cutoff? And nobody said no. Everybody said, you know, it's our family, it's our sisters, it's our mothers, it's our cousins, they're our kin. Um, they should get their status back. They never should have lost it. Uh, but what we heard, though, was uh, some things should be done to mitigate the impact. Uh, I heard a lot that there were promises in the 80s around C31 that were never delivered. Uh, and some of the big themes that we heard was around funding and resources to address uh, increased population, land, housing, and resources. So those were the big three, land, housing, and resources. Uh, impact. I heard all sorts of stories around the impact on health, education, infrastructure. Uh, I'm not an expert on all things that uh, my department is responsible for, but I have heard a lot about the issues uh, because it impacts because it stems from registration. Uh, from my perspective, registration and membership is at the heart of all of these issues, and this is the one that we need to fix. Uh, it, 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 I see it as a bit of a game changer. Uh, because it's so fundamental to people's identity uh, and communities and moving forward. So um, the reason I'm involved in this still is because I would love to work with communities on how to fix this, or how to clean up some of that mess that we've done um, and try to get out of this business. Uh, I, I joke with my colleagues of Indigenous Services, the plan for that department is for them to devolve and, and disappear so that it will be Indigenous Services by Indigenous for Indigenous. Uh, and I joke with them that I would very much love to put them out of work. Uh, so the big themes on removal of the 1951 cutoff was about funding resources for the influx of members. Um, there was also talks of, you know, cultural education, um, people being removed from their communities for decades, not knowing who they are, not knowing where they're from, people being uh, adopted out through the, the 60s scoop, kids in care being sent all over the place, not knowing who they are, where they're from, um, helping people reconnect with their culture and their identity and their community. Um, but the biggest one was increase of funding. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with all of the membership staff in Alberta. Uh, 
Canada considers them uh, IRAs, Indian Registration Administrators. It's a portion of the membership job that is done on reserve. And uh, the membership staff of the IRAs are some of the hardest working public servants in all of Canada. Uh, I cannot say enough good things about the work that they do in communities. Um, a lot of what we heard through the collaborative process was um, that the funding that we provide for membership is wholly inadequate. It's a half-time position. It is a calculation based on population. We pay $7.07 per capita. Um, there were communities getting less than $5,000 a year. Uh, and expected to manage the ban list, deal with registration and all of the privacy issues and challenges th that go along with it. Uh, so we heard um, that it needs to be, funding absolutely needs to be increased, um, but also access to our records. Uh, Canada has, you know, the pay list going back to the 1800s. Uh, we have black registers, which were the initial register started in the 1950s. It was a paper version. There's now an online system. It, it's all been... Uh, there's a database now. Uh, it's called the Indian Registration System. Uh, access to the system, access to the records, adequate funding. Um, if it was up to me, we would fix that yesterday. Right? That would be an easy one. We top up the funding. Uh, we make it uh, an adequate uh, wage for people to properly manage, and we provide the access and the support uh, and the training to go along with that and so that we can get the service that we are supposed to be providing to the place where it needs to be. When it comes to the registration uh, program, we have a six-month service standard. Um, we typically struggle to meet the six-month service standard. Uh, we heard that that is not a good service standard. Uh, I know that's not a good service standard. Um, Anybody born before 1985 is considered a complex case. Those applications are not processed in what we call regions. Um, so those are all sent to Ottawa. Applications that go to Ottawa take a minimum of two years in a lot of instances. So elders applying for status as a result of some of these changes, I've seen applications that go back decades. Uh, from my perspective uh, and from some of my senior management here in Alberta, that's not service. That is not helping anybody. Um, that's a disservice. So um, some of what we heard was, you know, it needs to be easier for people to apply. We need to clean up the registration process. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I've had the pleasure of doing a lot of work with the membership staff in Alberta to start all of that. I didn't need a collaborative process consultation to tell me that um, the way to improve service is to put it in the community where people are. So um, I know Doreen is here from TCV. I've known Doreen since I started, I think, uh, in 2013. Um, she's been in for training with access to systems and things. Uh, it's, but it's, it's not something that's common across the country. Alberta, again, is a bit of a leader when it comes to taking on these roles uh, and stepping into it. Uh, one of the best IRAs around is actually standing in the back right there. She just walked in. Hey. Uh, that's Claudia from Saddle Lake. I'm totally putting her on the spot. Yeah. Um, but when I do these, I, I make sure to, to put in a plug for the membership staff or the IRAs. The work they do is incredible. Um, they're the ones who deal with the challenges around our rules, and, and they're, they're really put in the middle. Um, and, and the view for service excellence is really to get that into the community. Um, 75% of all status cards that are done, for example, are done on reserve. Right. The majority of our clients are on reserve. Um, we still struggle with having a laminated uh, certificate of Indian status. There's issues around that. We have a secure card, but it's only done off reserve. So there are some real issues when it comes to the, the whole registration process that need to be addressed. Uh, and, and part of it is, um, you know, we can maybe get out of the business and work with the nations to reconstitute these lists in a more timely way um, so that it doesn't take years years for people just to regain their status, or for that matter, just to register and then go for a secondary process around membership. Um, the other remaining inequity, stream number two, um, was a, a kind of every sort of other issue you could think of related to registration came up through that process. Um, ancestors or descendants of individuals who enfranchised. 
you know, somebody, uh, someone's grandfather um, needed to go work. So he gave up his status, left. His wife lost status with him, and so did his children um, because they were married. Um, they all lost their status. They were able to come back in 1985. Uh, 61D of the Indian Act allows for individuals who had enfranchised. Um, but part of what they were saying was that um, – Canada has made changes for, you know, grandkids, great-grandkids resulting from sex-based discrimination, but not related to enfranchisement. So very similar scenarios where you would see 6162 non-status. Um, you have a grandfather who enfranchised. The, uh, now you might have a 6-2 parent. And once it hits the grandkid generation, there, there's now no status eligibility. Uh, and so they're saying that there's still inequities there. There's still descendants being impacted by this. It's not sex-based per se, it not, it, it's not really gender-based, but there are still other impacts. Um, and it all stems around the 6-2 or the second generation cutoff. Um, where I heard it um, most clearly was uh, a community in Ontario, um, Alderville, First Nation. Uh, they are still Section 11, so in order to become a band member, you need to be el eligible to register. They're not far outside Toronto, um, so uh, the community, as they told me, most are 6'2", meaning that they cannot pass status um, unless they parent with another First Nations person. And so what they're saying is that by 2036, the community will be extinct. Not that people have passed away or died, it's just the ability to transmit status will be gone. And because Canada still controls their membership through Section 11, if you can't register, you can't become a band member. And so they said things to me like, we need to move to a single parent rule. Um, deal with bloodline as opposed to blood quantum. Right, something that will exist for future generations so that they can make sure that their community is there alive and thriving for the next seven generations, not have it cut off after two. Um, they said to me things like, you know, what country on this planet doesn't recognize its children as citizens? Right? It was it was very powerful, impactful stuff, and they were so passionate about it um, that it stuck with me. So I I, I use them as as one of the examples uh, of how the six two or the second generation cutoff is still there. So what they were saying was six two needs reform. The second generation needs to reform. Um, as well as issues around enfranchisement. Um, you know, descendants of a man who enfranchised didn't stop being indigenous peoples just because their grandfather enfranchised. Uh, they still face the same racism and discrimination and things that people who are registered faced. Uh, but they're not able to be registered. They're not able to be band members. Um, and of course, like I said, the Métis want to deregister. Over the years, uh, every time we make a change to sex-based discrimination, there are Métis peoples who are able to register. And the courts have said that you cannot be Métis and First Nations. Uh, they say you have to choose. And so there was a time uh, where Métis people did register uh, in order to gain access to non-insured health benefits so that they could dental, prescription, eye care, that sort of stuff. Um, but they don't want to lose their Métis identity. They don't want to give up their Métis citizenship. They just wanted access to health benefits. Uh, and now, because of the way the laws are written, there's no way to come off the register. All right? so they were eligible to register. They did register. They cannot come off. And so they're saying, let them come off. Let them make a decision based on identity, not on practicality. And then stream number three, like I said, was really around exclusive control or responsibility for determining membership or citizenship. All right? Uh, and what we heard, government should not be, uh, should not have control over registration and membership. It should be up to the nations. Uh, we did ask other questions like, um, you know, are there other bodies that could be involved? Right, like tribal councils, for example. Is there a role there for tribal councils? That might be a discussion that happened through TCV. Uh, I know that TCV do, do some excellent work on status cards and registration right now with us on behalf of, of member nations. Um, you know, so there might be roles there. Questions around what does Canada do for people who are not deemed band members, right? There are currently people who are registered, 
but are not eligible for BAM membership. So does Canada still have a responsibility for those individuals? How can we do that? What should we do? Um, so there was there were some real questions there around uh, Canada's role in all of this, uh, and we could talk about you know possibilities when we get to the question period. Uh, but there were recurring themes that we heard loud and clear. Um, where ongoing discussions are required. This is a complicated issue. There is a long history to this. And sometimes when I showed up, it was the first time people had heard from somebody from my department in 20 years. And so people were just hearing about it for the first time. It was a lot to process. They wanted the conversation to continue. And so that's why I'm here. That's why I'm able to travel uh, out today is because that's my job is, is to be here to talk about this sort of stuff, to continue that conversation um, wherever people want. So if your nation wants me to come and talk to the community or do a presentation for chief and council, um, as long as I'm, you know, not booked, I'm able to, to attend and, and do those. Um, more time and engagement required. Uh, the big one, more funding, obviously. Funding is a big one. Uh, and um, capacity. Right, working with the membership staff, helping them to reconstitute band lists, deal with the influx of members, uh, and a lot around the principle that you know this should not be a top-down paternalistic government approach to things. Um, as much as we've heard for years and years and years what these issues are and stuff, the solutions need to be co-developed. It, it cannot be Canada just coming out as we typically do with an agenda and a plan on how we need to do this. Um, we do have some ideas on that, but the intention is really to co-develop, work with the nations on moving forward together to try and, and clean up this whole process. So next steps, uh, continue to inform, right? I, I am able to continue. Um, one of the things that, that has happened uh, and I, I hinted at a little bit in, in my opening. Um, INAC was split into two departments, right? Uh, so now there's Crown Indigenous Relations, which is where I'm currently working, and then there's Indigenous Services, which is where every, everybody in Alberta works, and that's where my substantive position is. Indigenous Services is supposed to devolve and disappear. Crown Indigenous Relations is the one that's left over. Um, Crown Indigenous Relations, my current department, is talking about ways of getting out of the Indian Act. Um, nations in Ontario, nations in Manitoba talked a lot about um, wanting to have exclusive responsibility over membership, but not Section 10. They did not like that it was still under the Indian Act, under the control, linked to registration. They very much felt that they should control status and tell Canada who's eligible. Um, so, so they were saying that you know they don't want to touch this process unless it's a way of getting out of the Indian Act. Uh, the Manitoba Nation said uh, a First Nations Citizenship Act, um, a way of kind of maybe opting out of certain clauses of registration and just re a, a law that respects nation's authority and control and laws around membership or citizenship. Um, so that CERNAC is really looking at that broader reform about maybe getting out of the Indian Act and, and um, what does that look like? How can we help? What are sort of some of those areas where um, we're falling short? Uh, membership funding is a big one. Um, we do have a plan um, for the next three years on support for membership. Um, it, it's tied up right now in the budget process, but we're expecting, I think the budget comes out in February. So we should start to hear uh, what's been approved or not approved as far as next steps. Funding is a big one that we have included in, in the uh, budget ask. Uh, and I can tell you that it's the Alberta nations that were the first out of the gate asking about funding for membership. Um, other nations were saying, you know, they want to develop membership codes. Uh, Alberta nations already have those codes, um, but some of them might be strongly aligned with the provisions for registration uh, and maybe haven't been amended since the 1980s. It was put in in, say, 1987. The code hasn't changed since then, but the Indian Act has changed. The Indian Act has been deemed discriminatory, uh, and so uh, nations were looking at amending codes or reviewing codes. Uh, and asking for funding for that. Uh, so there, there is plans for funding to help with that. 
Um, but with the split into departments, uh, it is Indigenous Services that deals with primarily with the Indian Act. So the registration program moved to Indigenous Services, and so the registrar and kind of the Indian Act is under uh, ISC at the moment. So anything registration related goes to the registration program. Right, so I was out talking about three streams. In essence, two of those streams have gone to the other department. Um, but the plan is to work together. Really not seeing large volumes of people register. My suspicion um, is that the people who are eligible now self-identify as Métis. Um, somebody who had a uh, First Nations great-great-great-grandmother who lost her status due, due to marrying a settler in the 1800s, that sounds very much like Métis to me. And so those people have been disconnected for generations, uh, and they probably grew up Métis, and now all of a sudden they might be eligible to register and potentially come back. And I believe, and I haven't been proven right or wrong on this one, is that they're not sure. And so that's why we're not seeing large numbers of people come back, is because now they're, they're having those questions. Uh, I do have a colleague who actually said that to me. Um, you know, she grew up Métis, but now she's realizing that there's a great-great-grandmother who lost as due to marriage. And so she's wondering, should I apply, should I not apply? What, should, what makes the most sense? So uh, next steps from Indigenous services are really around monitoring those impacts, looking at that. Um, we did hear, though, that, you know, wholly inadequate as far as funding goes, that does need to be addressed. Um, I'm not sure what the plan is as far as funding, um, because it did go to the other department. Um, but they do hear from me quite regularly that they need to fix it, and they need to fix it now. Um, I'm not somebody who goes to Ottawa and um, doesn't speak up. Uh, it is really important. Uh, I've had the distinct privilege of going to communities all across the country and heard the issues, and I've seen the pain in people's eyes. Uh, there's no way that I could go to Ottawa and not speak up about what needs to happen and kind of give them a push, right? give them a poke. Uh, it is important. Some of these changes need to happen. They need to happen quick. My hope is that April 1st, with the new budget, the, that you will start to hear that more funding and a plan for moving forward. Um, and that's really what kind of our next steps are here, right? Um, Indigenous Services talking about monitoring. They are talking about the other inequities around enfranchisement, deregistration, um, the second generation cutoff, unknown on state of paternity. They are looking at some of those other issues. Um, but those are issues related to registration in the context of the Indian Act. Right, so um, what I envision, what I see happening is, is two parallel streams. Indigenous services will try to clean up the current registration process as it exists, and Crown Indigenous Relations is gonna work on a mechanism to get out of the Indian Act and, and move towards um, full control and uh, addressing some of the capacity support and funding issues, right? But there, there is a joint responsibility here and there is a requirement to work together. And as people know, government does not move fast on some of this stuff. Uh, but it, it is very much my hope that we will have some answers soon and that we will have a, a we'll be coming out as, as soon as April to really start the work moving forward on working with nations on, on how we can move forward to try and fix some of these issues. This slide is really just the contact info. This would be where I stop and ask for questions. Um, and I envision like half the room with arms going up real quick. But I know we're, we're postponing the questions till later. So um, how do I do on time? I'm good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Doreen saying cut. Thank you. Uh, it, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. I look forward to your questions this afternoon. Uh, and I will be around afterwards for anybody who has any, you know, personal questions they don't want to ask in, in front. Thank you very much. Hi, hi.